Healthy? Yeah. Happy? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just a minor claim in 45 minutes to sort out your health, well-being, happiness and success. We'll see what we can do. How was lunch? <laughs> Healthy? <laughs> Feel energised by it? We're going to talk a little bit about food, but I think that's one thing we should frame at the beginning, is we're always looking for that slightly, as Margie said, deeper engagement, those pause for thought moments. When we deal with health, well-being, personal performance, and predominantly here we're working on two programs, the Accelerated Development Program and the Senior Executive Program. So those guys are here for four week long programs. So it's a great opportunity for them to take a step outside of their normal routine they're here primarily to think about their business and their professional life. But also, it's impossible to get the best possible results in your business and professional life without feeling as good as you should, as you could, possibly. So we use that opportunity to say to them, this is a time which you very rarely get in life to assess the behaviours, the lifestyle choices that you make. Look at that alongside the results that you're experiencing and think about what you might do differently. So on the Accelerated Development Program, those are kind of mid-senior fast-track managers. Let's say they're late 30s, early 40s. They've not lost sight too much of living a healthy life, because I think most of us do up to a certain point. Whereas when you look at some of the senior executives, they haven't paused for thought to think about some of their daily lifestyle choices for five years, 10 years, 15 years, quite a long time in many cases. Now that's not to say it's a bad thing because we never make any judgments. We never say that anybody's done anything wrong. But if you feel like you have been off track from what, where you would like to be for 20 or 25 years, then potentially it feels like a long way back. So what we're gonna look at today, and the reason why we've, we've pitched this as the ultimate guide, is because it's partly strategic as well as being practical. So we can talk a lot about the practical changes, and I'm gonna highlight to you some of the most recurrent themes for the practical changes that people make with their everyday life, particularly on those programs, but in other programs and other businesses that we work with as well. But underpinning all of that, and I think you'd have got a general sense of this as the day has gone on so far, is the why. Why does this matter? Why does this matter to me? Why does this matter now? Because if you can bring your health and well-being slightly up the priority list, and keep a continued but gentle level of attention focused in that area, chances are you're never going to be too far off track. So I had just a simple question to begin with, which kind of frames where we start from. Just think about that for a moment. How near to your ideal level of health, well-being, and personal performance are you now, or how far away from it would you say that you are now? Hands up those who would say they're quite close to where they would like to be with their health, well-being, and performance. Very good. Hands up anyone who thinks that they're quite a long way from where their ideal is. Is anybody exactly where they would like to be? If you had to rate it out of 10, it's a 10 out of 10. Would anybody say they've ever been a 10 out of 10 in the past? Yeah, no, go on, you can, it's allowed. <laughs> so we talk a lot about the performance level, the energy level, the focus. Because I think most people have had a time or some periods in their life when they feel great, they're performing well, life is good. You're in the zone, they would refer to that in a, an athletic sphere. Has everyone had that feeling? Hands up those who have. At some stage, hopefully, yes. So it is our belief, as a wellness company, that much of how you achieve that peak performance zone comes from the daily, weekly, monthly, annual lifestyle choices that you make. So you have the ability to control how much time you inhabit in that space. But what we find as we're working with people who go through their professional life as life moves on, your family grows, for example, lots of things that you had in place that were working tend to drop out the bottom and other things tend to expand. Family life expands, kids take over, but for many people as well, the professional life. You know, we're just working more and more and more 
and the balance, you know, work-life balance people are talking about all the time, seems to become out of kilter. Now people talk about high stress levels. Everything is demanding, everything is challenging. I can't think straight, I don't have time. I can't just still the noises in my head. So what we're talking about is you investigating and thinking about the simple changes you can make that bring that control back to you, bring the stress levels down, allow you to achieve that state of peak performance far more often. Now, I said if you were a 10 out of 10, you, know, you can probably also put a number, depending on where you are, out of 10 in relation to whether you're near or far away. You know, someone might be a 9 out of 10, I don't know how far to go. You might think that you're a 2 or a 3 out of 10, I have a long way to go. If you think of a number of where you are out of 10, now, can you think of anything that you could do that would move you up the rating scale? Hands up those who can think of at least one thing they could change. Okay, so what would those things be that would help us to improve health, well-being, performance, happiness, success? Sleep more. Sleep more? Okay, hands up who'd like to sleep more? Oh, wow. Well. Not now, obviously, but <laughs> later. Okay, sleep, good one. Any others? More exercise, food, what was that one? Less cakes. Less cakes. Very good. Any others? A holiday. Focus. Okay. So at the, at the end of the day to, to clear out and just park one and then move on to the other. Anything else? Well, yeah, more laughing. Lots of laughter workshops doing the rounds these days, just because some people have forgotten, I think, how to laugh. Um, anything else? Yes, technology is a killer, unless you set some parameters and some boundaries around it, which a lot of people are now starting to do a little bit more. Is there anything else that anyone has on their mind that they think they could do to get themselves up this rating scale towards a nine or a 10 out of 10? Traveling, yes. Okay, yeah. Just a change of mindset. Yeah. I think actually that's a kind of, that's one that underpins everything. Yeah. If you can change the mindset, all of the others can. It's hard to change habits unless you change the internal, the desirability, the emotional involvement. Um, so, when people are throwing out ideas, is there anything radical in what you're saying there? No. You all know what you could be doing. <laughs> so, what stops us? Time, laziness. So laziness is an interesting one, but they talk about this a lot. You know, what, what we do in one sphere, we might not necessarily do or be in another sphere. So when people say, I'm too lazy to do this, that or the other, they are then classify themselves as a lazy person. However, we can and we do find an example with every single individual where they are not lazy. So it's about, it's not laziness per se, it's about where you're choosing to direct your efforts and how much effort you think is involved in achieving a particular end. And I think when it comes to healthy lifestyle changes, people think, oh, it's, it's a big thing, isn't it? There was talk this morning about things being disruptive, you know, the, the level of disruption related to how willing you are or not to take action. And I think sometimes people think, if I want a, a more successful answer with my health and wellness, I've got to do a lot, I've got to change a lot, I've got to make it big. And for some people, that's true. You know, the more that they change, the more motivated they get, the, more, the quicker they are to take action. Some people prefer a different size objectives. But I think what we can say for everyone is that deep down inside we know what we should be doing. So there's another thing we find at the school a lot, there's a difference between the knowing and the doing. How do we bridge the gap between the knowing and the doing? So let's take the time first of all. How many hours do we have in a week at our disposal? 168. When you think... <laughs> Have you been in my workshops before? When you think about 168 hours, does it sound like a lot or does it sound like a little? Okay, so here we have, this is very subjective. Some people think it's a lot of time, some people think it's not very much. But it's the one thing that isn't variable, it's the one thing that we have all in common for all of us. So the question is not then about how you manage the 168 hours, it's how you manage your personal energy and effectiveness for each of those 168 hours. And people say, oh, well, you know, you've got to sleep for some of those. But I would say that applies there as well, because you do have some control over the quality and the quantity of your sleep. 
So you should be able to, if you position this correctly, maximize the effectiveness of every one of your 168 hours waking and sleeping so that you achieve your optimum result. So what is the optimum result? Why are we going to make the effort to manage our time? Why are we going to make the effort to make the changes that we know we should do but we're not yet putting in place? What is the point? Happiness. Happiness? Any others? Relationships. Yeah. Motivation. Motivation? As an end result? Or as a driver to an end result? And where do we find the motivation from? You. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> so the motivation comes from the end result. I think where sometimes we're put, put, people putting the cart before the horse. You need to decide what you are going to get out of this, otherwise you are never going to change. There has to be an emotional engagement. There has to be some involvement. There has to be an upside. Otherwise, it's a you should do this or you could do that. I'll go with what's most familiar. I'll go with what's easiest. I'll go with where the path of least resistance lies because you have many, many other things to think about. <laughs> so we're going to look at some of the practical things because in the course of the work that we've done, these things are very simple, sometimes too simple, I think. People say, oh, well, that's too obvious. I can't do that. But I'm saying if you can put these things in place, it frees up an awful lot of headspace, which will allow you to be more effective in other areas. So I listed five things on, your, on, the, on the pitch, and then I realized the slot I had was after lunch. So I've made it even easier <laughs> by breaking it down to seven things that you need to do every day. Watch your posture without moving. How are you sitting now? Observe and engage with your current posture. What do you feel? What do you notice? Slouchy. So, and where do you, do you feel anything physically from that slouching? The neck. It makes you a bit sleepy. Any others? So I say without moving, and everyone starts adjusting themselves already. <laughs> Because, yes, uh, those of you who studied coaching, NLP, CBT, things like that, you know, do you feel the mood and then the body language follows or does body language lead the mood? You can do both. And I think by adopting a positive and upright posture, mentally, it can be stimulating, you can be more focused, but also physiologically, you're much more safe, you're much more uh, able to perform and you're much less likely to incur any injury. Has anybody done any Pilates here? Hands up those who have. Oh, quite a few of you. Yoga. So why are you slouching then? <coughs> And yoga similar. So Joseph Pilates said, you should, and you can adopt this now, if you're in a sitting position, have a vertical line from your ears through your shoulder to your hips. Your knees should be 90 degrees and your feet flat. You should be supporting yourself from the midsection, which means you come off of the back of the chairs. Now, I'm aware of having sat in these chairs is a danger you're going to get fired across the room. <laughs> so you must control that from here. So the idea is that when you're in this position, and that's quite scary for me because everyone's twice the size now, <laughs> you are supporting yourself with the core stability muscles midsection. Fundamentally, though, you can get the shoulders back and down and the head on top of the body. 12 pounds on top of the body, 42 pounds if your head is jutting forwards. That's why people feel sore shoulders. That refers down to the mid, sometimes the lower back. If your head's coming into the screen here, or here, I mean, I don't know how they got Donald Trump to pose for that photo. <laughs> <laughs> He's busy. Um, too much of this, all the aches and pains. But also, for the brain, the oxygen transfer in your lungs is far more efficient the further down into lungs you breathe. You know, they're like upside down trees, the branches get thinner, higher surface area, more oxygen transfer into the blood, and then up to the brain. If you're sitting forwards, hunched and squeezed here, you're not going to think as well as if you get this much more upright <coughs> position. So, we talk a lot about the fitness you can do, go running, go swimming, play sports, all the rest of it. This is functional fitness. This is day to day. Perform well, think well, reduce the risk of any injury if you are a sporty person, but this is totally portable. This is something you can be doing for your health and well-being every day. And we know the thing that makes the biggest difference for people is feeling like they are contributing to the right direction as often as possible. This is something that can always be a positive. So I will remind you as we go. 
make some associations. I think we talked to a lot of people about how they change their work setup. That's not always possible, but even if you have a particular situation, you put a post-it on the screen to remind you to sit up. Ideally, you can change the work situation. Anybody got a standing desk? Do you find that helpful? Yeah. Um, one of our clients, is about 140 people in this big building, and they gave the IT people, because they never speak to each other, so they gave them standing desks as a way to get them up out of their cubicles and talking, because they were all hunched behind these things. So they were getting up, and they were getting on famously. It changed the dynamic of that whole section, and the rest of the office complained about the noise of the desks going up and down. <laughs> so they got rid of them. It's like, okay. Um, I've got one myself, I'd recommend it. But if you don't have a standing desk, you must set yourself an alarm to get up and move. So theoretically, we're going through our energy cycles every 90 minutes, roughly. So if you can set yourself a little alarm to get up and move around every 90 minutes, change the posture, change what's in front of your eyes, re-energize, go back to what you were doing. But we fundamentally think about the why. Why does it matter to me? If you have an injury, moving around will make it feel better. At risk of getting an injury, moving around will reduce that risk. If, it, if you know that it helps you think more clearly, you will do it, rather than just, this might be a helpful thing. Or if you have a particular sport where you think good posture, good strength, that will benefit me, that's another good incentive. But you have to pack up these positive reasons, otherwise not doing it then just becomes a stick to beat yourself with. So for all of these points as we go through, just make a little mental note of your why, your individual why. Hydration. Who would have guessed that that would be on the list? <coughs> it's the most obvious one of them all, I think. Would you say that you kept yourselves well hydrated today? <coughs> With what? <Water>. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> How much water are we supposed to consume each day? Two litres. Two litres. Hands up those who manage the two litres. So I'm preaching to the converted. Do you manage it every day, even when you're off in transit, on the go? So that's the thing to watch out for. Because I think we have these boxes that we put different compartments of our lives into. And just make sure that if you are able to tick those boxes, say you're in an office environment, you're easy to, it's easy to drink two liters. But also at the weekends, if you're on the go, if you're traveling a lot. If you're traveling a lot, it's even more important that you stay well hydrated because of the flying. Therefore, you must have these mechanisms, these habits, these routines in place that you can follow without having to think about too much that will get you the main benefit. It's on here because it makes such a massive difference. So they've done experiments with athletes. They make them perform various different tests. Then they allow them to become dehydrated and they repeat the tests. So even for like a 4 or 5% level of dehydration, the drop off in their performance is something like 20 or 22%. It's huge. So although we're not all elite athletes, you are trying to perform to the best of your abilities every day. Therefore, making sure that you're well hydrated becomes a no-brainer. It is a foundation of energy, focus, concentration, best possible performance. So just have a think about what you drink that hydrates you, what you drink that potentially dehydrates you, but come up with good reasons to make it work for yourselves. So there are many studies done on hydration. So people will then often come back and say, I read this thing last week. It says, it doesn't make a blind bit of difference how much water you drink. You're fine with coffees and juices, anything you can get your hands on, or not, as the case may be. But when it comes back to your specific choices, your body is different, your objectives are different, your lifestyle is different, all your considerations are unique. Therefore, all we would encourage for everyone is that you experiment, you try this stuff. Because what we often get is people coming back to us saying three months later, you know, I decided to try that drinking water thing. Actually, I feel much better. Why didn't you tell me that it was going to work? You say, well, we explained it. You have to live it. You have to experience it in order for it to be a positive and then become the new habit. Because fundamentally what we're doing is breaking down old habits, putting in new habits. So do not be afraid to be experimenting with these choices. Don't be afraid of tackling the tiniest little thing. You'll find the solutions often in the strangest places. Activity. Who's got a fitness routine in place? Hands up. How often does it work? Every week? Every month? Every year? Been in place for a long time? 
Yeah? <laughs> the reason I'm asking is because now, and it's certainly here, this is a tricky period. People have been quite good for the spring and the summer, then things tend to tail off a little bit for the autumn and the winter, hibernating slightly, and then we come back and, you know, God, it feels like a long way back in March. I've got to get back onto this thing. So often we're talking to people about, you know, this, this whole route, the routine has to work for 12 months of the year. You have to have some things that work spring, summer. You have to have a routine that works autumn, winter. Otherwise, you feel like you've wandered off plan again. How much time in your week, how many out of your 168 hours do you think you need or do you devote to exercise and activity? Four a week? Five? Seven? Any advance on seven hours a week? Fifteen? <laughs> Does everybody know in their head what their allocation for activity should be? If I do this much activity with this regularity, I know that I will feel great, perform well, energetic, sleep well, all the rest of it. That's the first place I would encourage you to start. What, do I, what does good look like for my fitness routine? Because if you don't have an idea of how much and what you do with the time, the perception then is, that it's something that just has to take up loads of time. And you see this a lot at, at New Year. So people who've got to the end of the year not feeling great, and they say, things will be different from now on. In January, I am going to the gym five days a week. I'm going to spend an hour and a half every time. I am going to be flying high by the middle of the year. Well, you'd be lucky if you last to the middle of the month, because <laughs> you've got plenty of other things to do. So you have to decide how much is acceptable, how much is reasonable, and how much will allow you, enable you, to hit your specific objectives based on what those objectives are. So who has a very clear objective with, for their fitness and activity? What's the point of it? So I think it's clarifying that, making sure that that's rock solid, but also making sure that there is always something. I'm guessing everybody knows what the biggest motivator to change with fitness and also healthy eating and sleep and everything else is. There's, there's something that drives people more than anything else. What would you suggest that might be? Weight loss is up there, but it's part of something else. And vanity is definitely part of this. <laughs> Ill health? Mental health is part of it. Summer. <laughs> Su summer? Did you say summer? Oh, sorry. I said summer. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's linked to that. So holidays is right up there. But the biggest driver is the impending wedding. So, so forget all the ill health warnings, advisory. That is not enough to change people's behavior. But the idea of being in a room with everyone you know looking at you, photographed, videoed, way ahead of time, you start hearing voices in your head that say, oh, well, I want Auntie Mabel to be saying this about me, or I want this conversation to... I think, wow, you know, it's got all the ingredients of a perfect, well-formed outcome. You, you build it, you create it in your head, you drive yourself towards it. What happens on the honeymoon sometimes can be a little bit of a different matter. So you have to have, I'm not saying, and I'm not suggesting, so don't go take this message away that you get married you know, every couple of years just to keep yourself motivated. But if that is the power of that driver, when you're thinking about something that will facilitate behavior change, it has to be that strong, it has to be that compelling, it has to be that exciting. So whether it's a sporting event, a challenge, a charity thing, whatever your version of that is, there needs to be something that's going to frame your day-to-day -day decisions and keep this stuff in the schedule. Because if it stays in the schedule consistently, you will feel good. If it falls out, and it falls out for a long period, and you know sometimes people go on holiday, don't go to exercise for a week or two, that becomes a month or two. Actually, on one of the senior executive programs, we do fitness sessions, so... Those of you who know this area, the park is just outside Regent's Park. Then we got up to Primrose Hill. So we did that with the group, did a few exercises along the way. Up top of Primrose Hill, obviously, you get a fantastic view. Jogged back down. We were doing some stretching here. And this guy went, oh, I feel quite good after that. He said, do you know what? That's the most activity I've done for 25 years. <laughs> so I said to him, how did this happen? And he said, do you know what? I don't really know. He said, well, I used to, you know, school and then university. I used to do stuff. And then afterwards, we used to play in this team. And then stuff, work, got busy. Kids came along. 25 years. 
Hap just like that. And it sounds ridiculous, but you can see how easily that would happen. So that is why these small, simple, but consistent positive behaviors add up hugely over time. So no exercise level is too small. Actually, do you know what they've got this down to? I'm talking about the time of this. Do you know they have <coughs> demonstrated, experimented with the minimum amount of time that we can get away with for getting active and still seeing positive results. Anybody know what the, the conclusion was? 20 minutes? Seven minutes. Seven minutes is good. Someone say three. Three minutes per? Three minutes per? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Can we do intense training? Yeah. Three times a week for about three minutes? Yeah. No, it's, no, actually, they concluded it was three minutes a week. So it was a minute of intense activity three times a week. But the secret, the, the, the reason it worked is because it was consistent. It was high intensity, it was focused, it was efficient, and it was consistent. It was three times a week, every week, for 16 or 20 weeks, I think it was. And it was run by a, a doctor, a TV doctor here, actually, who was getting older, didn't have any more time to spare, did not like the way his blood pressure was going, his cholesterol, his weight, but didn't have any extra time to devote to it. So he said, well, how can I get away with this? So it's the short, intensive, but regular burst. So that's what I would say to you. If you're looking now, it doesn't require a huge amount of time, you just need to make sure that it has a regular feature in the schedule. And the reason it will stay as a regular feature, have a goal, have an objective, have a sense of purpose. You will never question it. This is a, a little note from someone who was on Senior Executive Program just over a year and a half ago. She sent me that a couple of weeks ago because we had a long discussion. She really wanted to do something but just couldn't find anything that was interesting. And so on the note of experimenting, she continued to experiment. And then thankfully, 18 months later, she found the activity that she liked. It's in the routine. She's much happier. So you know, the game is never over here. It's always worth keeping an open mind on it. So having had your lunch, hopefully it wasn't this one. <laughs> it looks nice, though, doesn't it? Um, this is one of the most interesting areas that we work in, because this is where the knowing doing gap really gets challenged. This is where we have an internal dialogue like you wouldn't believe, you know, this is the most vociferous arguments on both sides of the why I should and why I could and why I won't and why I will. <laughs> Who thinks healthy eating could be easy? Who thinks it's difficult? So what you see is what you will get, I think, for some people. So let's decide now that healthy eating is easy. We have narrowed it down. The right thing at the right time in the right quantity. That's how simple it should be. But this has to be based on what you want to achieve with your food. So who is clear? I asked this about the fitness, but who's clear on their healthy eating objectives? And what might those be? <laughs> to achieve what end? And what does a healthy digestive system get for you or for anyone? Energy, energy levels. Yeah. Good. Any others? Avoid weight. <laughs> <laughs> so weight management, physicality, confidence. Anything else? <laughs> Anybody has any other thoughts around what? drives the choices or think about what drove your choices for lunch today what were you thinking about as you made your selection <coughs> it's got to taste good does that, is that agreed <laughs> yes i mean that's probably the number one reason why people fall off the wagon when they go for this you know all out healthy eating plan is it's bland it's boring it's, it doesn't interest me or it's too time consuming therefore if it takes too much out of my headspace i'm just going to go back to the old habits that i had so the pause for thought is crucial when making food choices. Why am I making this choice? And usually, it's habitual. It's routine. You know, if you looked at w people's food diaries, as we do regularly, some of them, you wouldn't believe how some people are still alive when you look at their food diary. <laughs> but you say, well, why are you making those choices? Uh, and it usually comes down, it was quick, it was easy, it's what I had available. But then we do the pause for thought afterwards. How did you feel? Similar to we did with, with lunch. You know. When you're making your food choices, we're looking for energy. It's usually energy-related, health-related, sometimes sleep-related specifically. 
But you want something to, it's fuel, it's energy. You're supposed to feel up and more dynamic and ready to go following a fueling session, not lethargic and sluggish after you've taken something in because you've given your body much more work to do. And most people, again, it's, you, you know roughly what the culprits are. It's about having that key driver that says, well, I know this is going to make me feel how this is going to make me feel afterwards. What is my incentive to stick with the plan that I know? Now, there's a great book called Triggers. Has anybody read the book called Triggers? Marshall Goldsmith talks about the importance of your environment and how, let's say, healthy eating, you might leave the house in the morning with the best healthy eating objectives. That, you know, today, it's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. Well hydrated, healthy snacks, meals, everything. Ten minutes later, you're in the line for the coffee shop. You've got a muffin in one hand, a panini in the other hand, and you're about to have a frappa lapa what's it? And you go, oh, well, how did this happen? So we are strong in the head until we're challenged externally. So when we talk about behavior change and how people transition from one way of being to the other, it has to be self-generated. And when we talk about the long-term changes that people make, you have to take a leap of faith in the beginning sometimes, I think, but you have to then gather evidence that it's the right thing. So this was a, a, fee a piece of feedback from somebody who was on Senior Executive Program, another guy. As soon as he thought it was about choice, then what he should do, or what he was being told to do, or what science suggested that was important for him, and he decided, I'm going to do this because better energy, better focus, my life is happier. He was much, much easier to stay on the plan. So I would encourage you to think, I mean, we always say, if you want to make change with a food routine, Keep a food diary first, doesn't need to be hugely detailed, but you have to have a snapshot of what's going on. That way you can then just flex and mold meals, snacks, one by one, and before you know it, you've got a food routine that works for you, whatever your routine is, wherever you are, it's transferable, it's portable, and it's practical, <coughs> which sounds to some people like a lot of effort to have to go through that process. However, we, have, we, you know, we work with people who have been battling with their healthy eating routine for many, many years. So you say, how long would you actually be willing to spend to fix this once and for all? And I don't think it would take that long. I think you could do that a few weeks of running that process and you would have the routine that gave you everything you wanted to with your food, health, energy, sleep. But so again, it's about taking that step back and thinking, how am I going to be slightly more strategic and pull out? Because you know, the, 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 re the research, the, the resources, the evidence is everywhere. There's, not, there's no shortage of healthy eating info. <laughs> but you have to tie it to something that's important and pertinent for you before you will make the change. So this is your mission moving forwards. So there's the other thing that everyone was preoccupied with. So, and, and sleep, I think we're, much, we're more interested in this kind of sleep than that kind of sleep where you're, you're dog tired and it's not quality. Do you all agree that your sleep routine is within your control? Yes and no. <laughs> How much thought do you give to your sleep? A lot. <laughs> How much thought do you give to your sleep beyond I wish I could sleep more or I feel tired right now? Who's got any wearable technology? Who's got a Fitbit or a Jawbone or a So you're tracking sleep. You can see the cycles. How does it look? <laughs> so having seen that information, collected the data, has that led to any behavior changes for anybody? You can't do yeah. regular rods, so let's try and, try and go to bed at the same time and get up at the same Yeah. It's not working. Does anybody, do, who has a bedtime? Yeah. Oh, that's not bad. Normally when we ask that question, we go, well, who do you think you're talking to? Bedtime? I'm not six. <laughs> Crucial. The bedtime is absolutely crucial. The routine <coughs> is absolutely crucial. Most people, we mention the pre-sleep routine, which for most people would be, what do I do for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes before I go to bed? It is absolutely crucial that you have a pre-sleep routine, something that you know conditions you physically and mentally to I am going to sleep and I'm going to have quality sleep. So that usually is some guidelines around technology, reading, music, interaction with other people. But also, and I say interaction with other people because, <coughs> not that sense. Um, 
may, often because we work with couples, one of whom would be a morning person, one of whom would be a nighttime person. And if you're a morning person and you're just leisurely winding down, you're coming to the end of an evening, it's half 10, quarter 11, you say, oh, great, I'm having great sleep now. And your partner, who is a night owl, comes flying in at 11 o'clock with, I need to move house. I need a new job. And you're going, not now, you don't. I need some sleep. But there's always that clash. It's often a big cause of stress for some people. So I think you know, communicating the important, you know, your rhythms to other people is important. But aside from the immediate pre-sleep routine, I think what we've seen make the biggest change of people is you go right to the other end of the day and you contextualize all of your choices through the day, what I eat, drink, how I manage stress, how I get active, everything is framed by will this help me sleep or will this detract from a good sleep? And it's an interesting question to ask yourselves because again, I think we know. I think we know that coffee number seven is probably not going to be the best thing, but oh, it'll make me feel better right now. But it's not going to make you feel better at four o'clock in the morning when the caffeine is still buzzing around the system. So I think when we start to frame it in that sense, it's not just an immediate benefit from that choice, but actually it's a 24 hour, it's 168 hour, it's a monthly benefit. Every, I'm guessing everybody does like coffee instantly. I don't. You don't? I don't. I don't. No. Okay, good. That's interesting. Never ever. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I only ask because you know, we're talking about habit change often with people. And these things, you know, we're, it's interesting how they creep up. So anybody want to guess the highest number of daily coffees that I ever have come across so far? 25. Someone said it there. Yes. So 25 espressos a day however so the, the point I mean that's not good the guy was not in a great state he didn't sleep very well very irritable not nice to be around he said all this I didn't I didn't make a judgment on him he said yeah it's not it's British rubbish um, but the point being he didn't sit down one day and start having 25 espressos you know he had one everyone starts their coffee career with one drink one day and then well that was good I have two you know, further down. and then three and then four so just because a little bit is good does not mean that more is better. And that's applicable for all of this. There's a balance to be had. But I think you must always stay engaged to stay on the right side of that balance. So something is good, it's enhancing, it's improving the quality, it's improving your happiness ultimately, but there's no collateral damage because that is a space that you want to inhabit. Incidentally, the guy with the 25 cups of coffee, we went round and round in circles trying to encourage him as to why it would be a good idea not to have 25 cups of coffee. But it wasn't until a little bit further down the line when we did the time management exercise with him and said, where do you spend your 168 hours? In a coffee queue most of the time or <laughs> driving around to the next coffee. It's like, he goes, oh, that is ridiculous. You know, I don't want to be on my deathbed thinking, well, what could I have done? Oh, I could have spent more time in a coffee queue. So uh, he stopped. He was worse to be around for a little while. But then he said, four or five months later, I felt like I got my life back. Which I think you know, from a one little espresso to I get my life back, that's quite a dramatic improvement. Sorry, one, one quick question. Uh, what yes. about posture during sleeping? Does it matter? Posture when sleeping? Yeah. Well, they, they, they advocate that you would sleep on your side. Mm -hmm. Actually, they advocate a, a pregnant lady position on your side with a pillow between the knees takes the pressure off the back. Not so much on the back if you can help it and definitely not lying on the front. That's the worst for the back and the neck as well. But I mean, it's difficult to adjust, so you, have, you probably just work through that. So taking time out. Everybody has mindful moments now and again? This is really, I mean, and the reason I put these pictures here is because I think when people talk about mindfulness, as they do a lot at the moment, there's a perception of sitting on your own in a room somewhere doing nothing, which is a version of mindfulness. That's absolutely fine. But also, I think everybody has their own version of mindfulness. So for me, I'm much more, yeah, that, that's when I access, when I'm running, I can access different parts of my brain. Everything gets put in perspective. Everything calms down. A new focus, new ideas, come back, a new person, which is a good investment of time, I think. For other people, I mean, that's, we, we've put that there because um, Eating is something people just de don't do mindfully at the moment, you know, wolfing down as fast as you can. So often in mindfulness workshops, they will do a food exercise where you slow down and engage with what you're eating. But actually, that's a, that's a knitted dish of food. <laughs> so 
One of the things that they did at the school this year when we were doing our wellness program was they, we set up a running club, but they also set up a knitting club, which was remarkably popular because it's time to do something different, to, do, to use your brain, use your physicality differently, to spend time with other people. So be creative with what your mindful moments might be, but don't overlook it, okay? The thing is, it's always time. I don't have time to step aside and... How are you going to have new, creative, incisive thoughts if you don't step aside from the norm? If you always do the same thing the way you've always done it, not much is going to change. And that's good for much of what you do. A lot of stuff done on autopilot, if it's working, carry on. But always pause for thought to check that things are still working. Don't be doing the things that worked for you 20 years ago. You see this, if, you, if you've watched football or soccer, you see the football players doing stretches and stuff that you, know, you just wouldn't do now. Nobody would say, that, that's, they're all contraindicated because they give you neck ache and back ache and all the rest of it, but football training is this, it's done this way, this is the way we've always done it. But you must update, you must evolve. What got you here might not get you there. So this is the bit that underpins it all. The practical is easy, but what you should leave with now is if you don't already have it, the why, the strategy, the underpinning driver for my healthy lifestyle choices. Because they're easy to identify once you know where they're going to get you, what they're going to get you. As I said, the information is out there. It's easy to access. But you've got to know what information to go and get. So we're at the end of November now. Was anybody contemplating any healthy living resolutions for New Year? New Year, you mean the eve of the, the 31st of the Yeah, for 2017. Oh, not just today. <laughs> so, I would suggest if you were, or if you think you want something to be different or new in next year, bring this forward. Start it now. Get yourself a head start. This is a big matter. If you can get on plan for the next four weeks, that is your springboard for the next year, and the next year, and the next year. Because we know, having worked on the programs here for nearly 10 years now, we stay in touch with people. These things done consistently, year after year after year after year, will make an enormous difference. Not just physically, but mentally. You're in control. It's your project. It's working. You're evolving it. You're flexing it. And one of the most important things here is if you can work out how to do this, you can work out how to do anything. If you can come up with a strategy that works for how I take care of myself, how I achieve my best and peak performance for the majority of the time, which fundamentally would be a fantastic thing for all of us, you should then be in a position to apply those same strategies to any issue, any challenge, any problem that you come across in life. So that's why it's the ultimate guide, because it's not just about your own health and well-being. This strategy, the measures, the ways, the procedure, you can achieve anything. Anybody have any quick questions about their healthy living before we finish? Is everybody clear on what they need to do? <laughs> what do you need to do? <laughs> Plan. You need to take a moment, you need to think about the why, and you need to put a plan together. Do you do that anywhere else in life? You do it every single day at work. And you don't do it, for, well, many people don't do it for themselves. So we're not saying reinvent the wheel here. We're saying model your own success. Take the strategies, take the approaches, take the ways of operating by which you achieve the right results elsewhere and apply them in this sector. And you will never go too far wrong. And if anybody wants a bit of extra accountability, send me, email me your resolutions from today and I'll be happy to keep an eye on them and see how they go. <laughs> right. Good luck. I wish you all the best with it. <laughs> okay.